Okay, welcome to this week's VTS discussion. Uh, let's go ahead and get right into it. Okay, so here's our artwork that we're going to be looking at. And this is uh, what you're going to be putting down for your visual... Uh, <laughs> now the word left me. Uh, for the things that you see visually on here, we're going to need at least four of them. So we're going to talk about several different ones. Uh, so one of the things we notice here is the lighting. There is one source of lighting on this uh, piece of artwork that is very intently shining off of these people's faces. They did a very good job with that. Um, we also notice that they're all sharing one plate. So what that could probably mean is that this is a poorer family. Uh, probably some of the working class of whatever time this was in. Uh, we notice with the artwork, the strokes that are made on here, they're very rough, rough strokes because you can see a lot of them. So this is not probably any of the, the classical and academy type art. Uh, this is something else because their art was very, the, the whole purpose of what they did was to make invisible brush strokes where you couldn't even tell that it was painted. Uh, but this person clearly doesn't mind making it known that this is definitely a painting. So we can notice that. We also see some other visual details here. Um, with the We have some artwork up here on the wall or a picture. It looks like a religious painting. A clock. Um, so we have uh, some of the furniture here. We see there's a little bit of a distortion as to the perspective here. Kind of the chair throws us off a little bit uh, versus how he's sitting, um, maybe the ceiling here. Um, and we also notice that the house that they're in isn't a very nice house as far as what would be maybe considered niceness back then. Um, it's just a very, very basic house. So uh, let's look a little bit closer. Uh, here's how oh, we can see the brush strokes even more, especially here on the hand and on the table how they have lots of different colors in here on this one single table which gives it a very nice look um, and all the lines the the brush strokes I mean here uh, for the lighting that's behind this person's silhouette here okay so let's move on this is called the potato eaters by a very familiar artist or at least hopefully he's familiar to you Vincent van Gogh Okay, so we're going to try to go through this decently fast because it's a pretty long set of slides here. Uh, so this piece was created by a well-known Dutch artist named Vincent van Gogh. It was in the year 1885, so make sure you write all that down. It's painted in oils, so there's the media that he used. The artwork itself was a little over two and a half by three and a half feet. And van Gogh was one of the most productive painters you'll ever hear about considering the time frame in which he painted. Within a period of 10 years, which that's the only time he painted was a 10 year period about, he created around 2,100 pieces of artwork. That is a lot. And most of these were from the last two years of his life. But he may also be one of the most troubled artists you will hear about as well. Okay. So let's uh, talk about Vin Vincent van Gogh's life here for a little bit. Um, it's interesting to get into the minds and the, and the lives of these artists, especially some of the ones that they kind of had a rough time in their life. So you don't think of him just as an idealistic painter that just painted these cool things. Uh, this person had, had a life and had troubles of his own. So Vincent... Willem van Gogh, which was his full name, was born on March 30th, 1853 in the Netherlands into an upper middle class family. So they were pretty well off. Like many artists, he drew a lot as a child and he was very serious, quiet, and thoughtful. A movement known as Impressionism started gathering steam in 1867 when he was 13 years old. He wasn't involved in it at that point, but it is something that would end up affecting him as he was going to start getting into artwork as this era was starting to die down. So 
By the time he was a young adult, it was in full swing, which is Impressionism. He began work as an art dealer at that time, not actually doing art yet, which included a lot of traveling around. When he was transferred to London, though, he began to show his first signs of depression. Okay, so here begins Van Gogh's trouble. So he turned to religion at first for help, spending time as a Protestant missionary in southern Belgium. His health and emotional state declined, and he eventually ended up isolating himself from the rest of the world. This led him to move back in with his parents uh, back in the Netherlands at age 27. His younger brother Theo was the one who now supported him financially and encouraged him in his art. So. He had a relationship with his brother. Here's a picture of both of them at different times, clearly, because his here's Theo, as Theo was a bit older, and uh, here's a younger Vincent Van Gogh. And uh, so Theo didn't live with their parents with him, so they ended up having to talk back and forth by mail. It was 1881, near the end of the Impressionist era, and the time he finally began to take up painting. This is where the creation of those 2100 works of art began. So, the works created by Van Gogh between the years of 1881 and 1882, when he started, are considered his early works. So there's that two-year period that people say, well, these are his early works. Because, I mean, when you only got 10 years to work with here, you know, you got to just pick the first couple of ones as their early works. So, uh, and we'll find out why he only painted for 10 years towards the end of this slide. So, his first pieces of art were mostly paintings of still lifes and images of peasant laborers, such as the one we're looking at today. Uh, this was partly due to him being in the last years of the Impressionist movement and due to other artists he looked up to. The first ones mostly consisted of watercolor, chalk, and other drawings. So, here's a chalk drawing. A watercolor drawing and here's another one this one is a uh, possibly chalk or it could be an oil I'm not too terribly sure what kind that is uh, so anyway uh, if you need to know more about the impressionist era uh, you can look that up if you need to because that era really uh, kind of influenced him at the beginning so in 1882 this is his second year he went to The Hague, how it's pronounced, which is a city in the province of South Holland, and studied with his cousin-in-law, Anton Mauve. Mauve helped fund, fund a studio for him and taught him how to paint with oils. So uh, even if he painted previous la previously to that with oils, it probably wasn't very skilled with it. So here's where he really learned how to use them. He also received an offer for commission of paintings at this time which is when people hire you to go and paint stuff for them. So what he produced, unfortunately, was not acceptable. So they didn't like it. But today, the things that he painted for that commission are considered masterpieces. He just never got any money from it. So the poor working class fascinated Van Gogh, and he aspired after the works of Jean Francis Millet. So here is uh, The Hague, where he moved. Uh, it's a modern day picture. And here's some of the artwork he did while he was there. This is clearly a rooftop of one of these similar houses, uh, buildings such as this. And uh, here's another one, uh, drawing type thing that he did of the middle class working. So uh, let's look at Millet. This is a guy that inspired him. Okay, here's a picture of Millet and some of his artworks. He died in 1875, though, at the age of 60, so he was no longer living at the time that Van Gogh became intrigued by his artwork and the peasants and laborers and stuff like that that he drew. So uh, he was long dead and uh, when uh, Van Gogh started painting. So, But these are some of the things that he looked at from Millet and got inspiration from. So the Potato Eaters was completed at this time. He first made a lithograph of the composition before endeavoring to paint it. He sent impressions to his brother, and this is one of the images of the impression uh, that he made, which is a reverse, okay, because when you, you stamp it on there, it leaves that image, so it would be 
kind of the opposite. And you notice a few things are different about this too. This on the wall, uh, you see it right here, but there's a lot more details with things. Uh, here's two, two things over here. The clock's a little bit different in this one. Uh, the sizes you can tell are different. Um, the roof, uh, the ceiling, I mean, up here is much different. Uh, and even some of the faces are different. This lady versus this lady. It's quite different. So, uh, anyway, so this is kind of, oh, and her hat. It's a little different. So there are some things here and there that he changed. There's a little tea kettle here that's not in the original lithograph. So, so anyway, uh, he seemed to identify, oh, sorry. He sent impressions to his brother and said that he made the image from memory during the course of a single day. It was pretty amazing. He seemed to identify with the middle class and had an appreciation for a simpler lifestyle, even though he's from a well-off family. So he kind of didn't like living well off. So the subject here was the harsh reality. So this is something you want to write down as to why he did this. It was the harsh reality of life in the working class. He also admired the sustainability of the potato, which is what they're eating. Okay. Which in Dutch translate to earth apple. So there's you a new name for a, pota for a uh, potato when you go by and tell your parents, hey, I want an earth apple. <laughs> so by 1886, okay, the next year he was off to Paris. There he met members of the avant garde, who were a radical, unorthodox group of artists who challenged the art boundaries of the day. Remember, it was Impressionism, so they were going against that. Well, not some of them were, and some of them were kind of wanting just to make it better. So uh, he developed a good friend there named Paul uh, Guagin. I think that's how you say that. Um, these people were reacting to the Impressionist sensibility. Their movement became what is known as post-Impressionist movement. They extended Impressionism while rejecting its limitations. So they were wanting to push it further and get rid of the limitations that the Impressionists put on that style. So they kept using vivid colors, thick paint, and real-life subject matter, but they were more inclined to emphasize geometric forms, distorting things for expressive effect, and use unnatural arbitrary colors, so things that were not necessarily that color. Like, for instance, some of this, these apples here. Okay, This is not the color of an apple you're going to find if you go to the store. If it is, I wouldn't buy it. So keep those things in mind, what this uh, post-impression is about. So the post-impressionists were not in agreement, though, on a cohesive movement. That means they weren't all like, okay, this is exactly how you have to do this move, this style. This is exactly how you have to paint. So as a result, uh, it developed many different yet purposefully similar styles. They did all agree on one thing, that the abstract ideas of harmony and structural arrangement took precedence over naturalism. So, Many even developed a highly scientific approach to art. So even though they all kind of did things a little differently, they were all leaning toward more abstract things and an arrangement of things on the page in a structural way, not, ex not necessarily exactly how it appeared when they looked at it. So if you've guessed that this would later make way for cubism, and you are correct. It actually did. So let's look at some of the people involved in this and their styles real quick. Because Vincent van Gogh was mixed in all this. So among the different styles, George Charette uh, started pointillism using systematic tiny dots of color everywhere. And we see that down here. Okay. While others followed Paul Cezanne, uh, Cezanne uh, making solid, durable, and structured strokes. Uh, Camille Pizarro, the oldest guy of this bunch, uh, he came from Impressionism. So he was young when all this Impressionism started. And he tried a little of everything in this new movement before going back to pure Impressionism, back to his roots. 
So the post-impressionist ideas rubbed off on Van Gogh, and he developed his own post-impressionistic style as well. He began to develop a new approach to his still lifes and local landscapes. So what changed? The most notable change after 1886 in his artwork was the use of bright colors. And by 1888, his now signature style and colors became part of all of his artwork. So here's a couple of the people, and uh, we didn't talk about Henry here, but uh, here's one of his. And uh, Cezanne is right here. Uh, so let's look at the last part of Vincent Van Gogh's life. Unfortunately, though, all was not well for Van Gogh. During all this time, he suffered from psychotic episodes and delusions. He also neglected his physical health, and he ended up, in, ended up drinking heavily, which didn't help his episodes at all. So after watching him fall into a fit of rage, holding a razor and cutting off part of his own ear, uh, Van Gogh even lost his good friend, Paul. So the guy that he had met earlier, okay, that kind of got him into all this stuff, uh, he lost his friend because of his craziness. <laughs> uh, and this is the guy that he met years earlier at the Advent Guard. So Van Gogh eventually ended up in various psych psychiatric hospitals and seeing lots of different doctors. And his depression continued until July 29th. 1890 when he ended his own life by a gunshot wound to the chest at age 37. So here is a self-portrait that he dedicated to his best friend that he lost. Uh, this is just a couple of years before he killed himself. Here is some of the artwork that he did. And uh, from this is just you now, you know, because he didn't, there wasn't a large span of years that he did this. So here's just a group of them here. This was all from, from 1889, except for this one, which is a very familiar one for most people. This is from uh, 1889. And we could see all the colors that he used in all of those. Uh, so this one was a little bit different, the potato eaters, because it's so dark. You know, there's not very much color there. So, uh, which, this, this was right before his big change, right? When he went to lots of bright colors. You can see the difference here. This one was 1885. This is 1888, like those other ones we just saw. So as far as his artwork goes, he was quite unsuccessful while he was alive. And it seems odd for such a man to have produced so many works, but be unsuccessful. But that's because most saw him as a madman and a failure. So, unfortunately, he didn't become famous until after his suicide. And he's now looked at as a misunderstood genius. Many say that he was the artist where discourses on madness and creativity converge. His reputation grew after 1900 with the Favs and the German Expressionist. And we're going to say one thing about Favism, okay? Because... Uh, his his style really helped produce Favism. So it's a French word meaning the wild beast. It's what they were called. You know, all these people ended up getting made fun of and names stuck and things like that. So it was a movement of artists in the early 1900s that like the works they saw of Van Gogh, because they were looking at a lot of his colorful stuff that they did. It emphasized qualities of painting and strong color over the representational or realistic values and light retained by the Impressionism. The style itself began around 1904, but only lasted until 1908. Artists did continue the style, though, until 1910. So it was a very short-lived time period of Favism. Andre, uh, Andre Durain and Henry Matisse, which y'all should know, were part of this movement. Two of Matisse's works from 1895 are shown above, right here, these two, the ones that look very professional, very nice here, and then two of Henry Matisse's works after the influence of Van Gogh's work during the Favism movement are over here. So how did his art change? Well, dramatically, one of the biggest changes you see is how these are much more messy and they're much more colorful, right? 
and the color is not normal. The colors here are natural and normal, what you would expect, but here you don't expect green on people's faces and blue in the background, so that's big difference. So, last thing we're going to say, on a side note, uh, thieves did still, uh, they broke in and stole the early version of the potato eaters, along with a few other pieces of artwork from the Kroller Muller Museum in December of 1988. The thieves, which really isn't too long ago, the thieves tried to get a $2.5 million ransom for the art, but it didn't work. The police eventually recovered everything by July 1989, which is, you know, a little less than a year later. So, last thing to say here, we could admire the dedication of Van Gogh to his art, because he was very dedicated, despite the ridicule he received, and despite his emotional troubles that he went through, and even despite, really, that he was not successful, but he kept going, because he said this is what he was born to do. He had to do art. This is what he had to do. So, and though he was not popular at his time, his artwork as well as his story is iconic in today's society. They've even made an emotionally riveting movie about him called At Eternity's Gate, which the actor that plays that part is an amazing actor for what they were doing. I don't remember the guy's name, but you can look it up. And in this movie, they attempted to get into the mind of this most misunderstood, troubled, and amazing painter. So, I haven't watched the show, but I plan on watching it, uh, so I can't give it a rating, don't know the contents, but the, um, the preview looks uh, pretty good, and uh, it looks very interesting to get into, you know, to see how they're going to portray this man uh, that was so troubled, but so amazing at the same time, and, and what he did. So, okay, this is it. Uh, go ahead and make sure everything was filled out on your VTS discussion page. Uh, go ahead and fill out your um, your opinion, uh, your opinion part, and why you think this artwork should be appreciated. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this, learning about Vincent Van Gogh, maybe some of the things that you didn't know about him, and, uh, and the importance of this piece of artwork specifically, maybe even if it's not to history, to him, as a person, why this piece was important to him as well. Uh, and go ahead and get your art uh, A&E set up and get that ready. And uh, we will uh, continue with another slide the next time. Thanks.